Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Mike Yassa. I am the director of the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory, and I am delighted to be your host tonight. As you all know, the Magaud Girard Lecture on Learning and Memory is a brand new series that we are launching at UCI, and we're delighted that you're able to join us here today for the launch of this series, which marks yet another exciting and great example of UCI's commitment to public education and service. Now, we as an academic community believe very strongly that it is our responsibility to disseminate knowledge and science that happens right here at UCI. It is one of our core values at UCI. And it is only fitting that this happens on the best stage that we could find, the Irvine Barclay Theater. We're thrilled to once again partner with the Irvine Barclay Theater, who have been our partners for over 20 years in hosting public lectures. And I'd like to sincerely thank the team at the Barclay Theater for their uh, work with us on this series, and especially uh, the president of the Barclay Theater, Mr. Jerry Mandel, for his support of this tonight. Now, I will keep this short. I know this is a, a packed house, and I know that many of you had to drive quite a distance to be here, and we are delighted um, that you are here. You made it. Um, this is such a joy to see, and it really is incredibly exciting for us to see the enthusiasm and commitment from the community for the work that is done right here at UCI. We couldn't do it without you, and we're just so happy that you could join us. Now, up next, to introduce our speaker tonight, Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the sixth chancellor of UC Irvine, Chancellor Howard Gilman. Thank you, Professor Yasa. And good evening, everyone, and what a good evening it is. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the inaugural Magaw Gerard Lecture. It is my great privilege tonight to introduce our speaker. You may have heard of him. He's also my dear faculty colleague, our distinguished professor emeritus James L. McGaw. This is the first time you're allowed to clap, but you're gonna clap a couple of times. Oh, that's good. From the day UCI opened its doors, almost exactly 53 years ago to the day, neuroscience and the study of the mind have been among our towering academic strengths. This is due in large part to the contribution and life's work of James McGaw. The UCI Department of Psychobiology, now renowned as the UCI Department of Neurobiology and Behavior, was the very first department of neuroscience in the world when it was established in 1964. Professor McGaw was its founding chair. The UCI Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory established in 1983, was the first research institute in the world dedicated exclusively to the multidisciplinary study of learning and memory mechanisms in the brain. Professor McGaw was its founding director. You may be sensing a theme here. James McGaw is a pioneer of biological science who has been at the forefront of every advance in the field. He is internationally renowned for his studies of drug and hormone influences on memory, as well as for his more recent work on highly superior autobiographical memory. Sir Isaac Newton famously said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants in the field of memory creation, retention, and recall, James McGaw is a giant. When Professor McGaugh first came to UCI, he was one of the 11 original department chairs of the university. In the years since then, in addition to all of his scientific advances and achievements, he has served as Dean of the School of Biological Sciences, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost. He has mentored thousands of undergraduates, hundreds of graduate students, he has received virtually every honor the scientific community can bestow, including membership in the National Academy of Sciences and fellowship in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Here at UCI, he has received the Distinguished Faculty Award for Research, the Extraordinarius Award, which is the UCI Alumni Association's highest honor, and the UCI Medal, the university's highest recognition. The Biological Sciences Building, McGaw Hall, is, huh, named in his honor. 
It is difficult to imagine what UCI would be like today if Jim McGaugh had decided back in 1964 to stay at the University of Oregon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor James L. McGaugh. Chancellor, thank you very much for that excessive, highly excessive introduction. Uh, it didn't sound like me, but I'm here anyway. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I have to say that uh, when I made it possible for this um, series to be established, and I was asked to be the first speaker, I thought, well, that's okay. As a first speaker, there'd be my friends and neighbors in the first four rows and all the seats will be empty, but I'll get it started. That, that'll be a good thing. I am astonished to see it filled. I'm really astonished and I thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you will come to future lectures in this series as well. Can I count on that, I hope? Yes, yes. thank you. So what I wanna remind you of, to begin with, is that um, although we all think of memory as the past, we think, oh, what was it like, you know, 20 years ago? What was it like in high school and college? What did I do for vacation and so on? That's luxury. That's not what memory is about. Memory is about the future. The reason that we have memory, and all of the animals that have ever been studied have memory, is it provides information that you can use for behaving in the future. I mean, think about it. You, you may think about your vacation, or you may think about high school, you may think about these thi those things, but that's not what's important. Those, those are just luxuries. What's important is how to get through the day, how to get tomorrow, how to look for the future, how to plan. That's what education is about. Education is not, not about the past, it's about the future. That's why we have schools, that we, it's why we have universities. Have universities because you want to acquire information that the brain provides that you can then use for doing things in the future. It's about that. Now when you think about it, there are lots of things that happened to you this week and, and even today. Um, I don't, uh, how many of you drove here? Most of you drove, right? I don't think you remember the feeling on your rear end when you sat down to get in the car. At the time, I could have asked you and you could have told me, but you don't remember that, it's not critical. If on the other hand, you had been injured and got in and it hurt, you would remember and that would be predictive of the next time you don't wanna sit in that way. So memory is always happening. It's going on all of the time. I hope it's going on a little bit right now. <laughs> And the purpose is not for reminiscence, the purpose is to guide your and my behavior in the future, that's why we have it. Now, this is from a, actually from a program, uh, that, uh, from a drama production I went to a number of years ago, and I thought it was so important that I stole it, I got permission from the author. It says, our brains, remarkable as they are, could not begin to contain and give equal weight to our every moment of life. Although we have the ability to acquire information, we don't learn everything. We learn some things, and we learn pitifully little about what happens in our lives. That's what's amazing about it. We have a machinery, the brain, which is designed to acquire information so it can be used, and yet we remember very little about it. There, there's a certain irony of there, I think, that's important. Now, I was a happy uh, associate professor at the University of Oregon when I got a telephone call in January 1964 asking me if I'd like to be considered as the founding chair of a department that he was going to create, one of four departments in a school of biological sciences. And as you heard in the introduction, the first department of its kind ever in the history of the universe. That is, in the School of Biological Sciences, four departments, and one of them was, was to focus on brain and behavior. That had never been done before. That was very insightful, and that was the idea of Dean Edward Steinhaus. It was solely his idea, and I agreed. I came here as his instrument to do that um, for two reasons. 
Uh, one, uh, because it was an opportunity to build a department right in an area which was mine. It could be a department which is focused on things that I'm interested in, how the brain works to give us behavior. Um, another reason was because the first name of this place is the University of California. Think about it. The best public university known in the United States and one of the best public universities in the entire world, University of California. Now, I'm a product of Berkeley, so I know a little bit about the University of California at Berkeley, and I thought how wonderful it would be to have an opportunity to come and build a new institution which would be even better than Berkeley. So <clears throat> I met Ed Steinhaus, and he took me over to the corner of Bison and MacArthur. And I think most of you know the reason it's called Bison is because there were really some bison there when, when I came. And he pointed over to <clears throat> an area and said, that's where the university is going to be. And I looked over there and saw nothing. <laughs> nothing. But I said it looked great. And, uh, <laughs> and then, <clears throat> This is an aerial view, which I was not in an airplane, I was on the ground. And uh, uh, you, you can see uh, that is Steinhaus Hall uh, under construction. And you can see a winding little path up in the top there. In order to get to the to-be-developed campus, we had to go on a ranch road, open a barbed wire fence, and drive up and we could see, this is pretty far along. When I first saw the campus, the buildings were about four feet out of the ground. But um, there was a vision there and he had the vision and he transferred that vision to me and I came to join with others in 1964 um, to help build a campus. And I, I want to remind you that of that early period here at UCI, uh, there were three faculty members who went on to win the Nobel Prize. Very distinguished group of people. Now, one of the people who interviewed me was Dean Girard, uh, Ralph Girard, who was a, an, an eminent neurophysiologist. And um, you can see he's holding glasses in his hands, but when I met him, he was, had his glasses on and he was peering down at me. Uh, trying to find out what this young kid was doing. I was very young at the time, uh, having the audacity to think that he could come here and um, establish a department. But apparently, um, he didn't disagree violently, so I was offered the job, and I came. Now, lots of things happened that year. There, were, there was a very small group of us who had to plan for the campus. We had to decide what the... Uh, Requirements would be for graduation. We had to uh, decide whether it would be a, a, um, a, a three, three quarters a year or two semesters. All of these details had to be decided because after all, we were building a new university and we worked every day. Uh, over in, on Jamboree Road, the metal buildings on the corner of Jamboree and campus, that was the University of California for 1964, my first year that I was here. Now, in, in uh, June of 1964, the campus was um, dedicated, and believe it or not, that is me, and, and that's my daughter, Janice, who is here tonight. Where are you, Jan? Right here. Raise your hand. Stand up. <laughs> 1964, and President Johnson inaugurated the campus. Now, all of those are remembrances, and they turned out to be useful to me because I can tell you about it. So they had a function. I had these ideas, I had the things I remember, and now I can tell you about them. So the brain was useful in um, that regard. But a lot of other things I don't remember. I remember the room where um, the dean interviewed me. It was a very small room in this metal building over there, and I remember peering down his glasses at me. I don't remember what I had to eat that day. I don't know how I got there. I don't know a lot of details, but I remember some of them. Now, uh, William James, the most famous psychologist ever, uh, wrote a very important book, and I stole this from him. It says, 
Of some experiences, no memory survived the instance of their passage. Others may be recalled as long as life endures. How can we explain these differences? William James, 1890, and that's what I want to talk about. How is it that I can remember having been interviewed for the job? How is it I can remember the inauguration? How can I, how can I remember that I stood over there on Bison with a campus pointed out to me? How can I remember the barbed wire bar fence? Those are details that I can remember, but they were very, very important to me at the time. Now, the, the question of how memories become strong enough to have some degree of permanence is something that philosophers has thought about for a long time. And I have a quote here from Francis Bacon. And this is critical because it guides the rest of what I'm going to tell you this evening. Francis Bacon said, memory is assisted by anything that makes an impression on a powerful passion, inspiring fear, for example, or wonder, shame, or joy. So think about it, my early days here, coming here to build a new university, meeting people, uh, seeing bison, all of these things. They were, my memory was assisted by a powerful passion. I was excited. I was emotionally aroused by all of that, and it created a strong memory. Now, this has been understood by lots of people, including cartoonists, and here we have uh, Gary Larson, who said, more facts of nature, all forest animals to this very day remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard that Bambi's mother had been shot. <laughs> and they're all telling where they were. Now, the question is, were they just reminiscing, or did that have any significance for their future? Is it possible when they said that, they were wondering, am I next? Is there somebody here who's going to shoot me? And we just don't know that. And this was also something that philosophers thought about. Descartes, just a few years later uh, than that quote I just showed you, said the usefulness of all of the passions, all of the emotions, consists in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul thoughts which are good for it to conserve. So the function of emotion is to create strong memories of things that are important. So I can look back and say, one reason I remember these very significant things in my life is because I was emotionally aroused by them, and then that automatically, the brain took care of it. I got excited, and the brain did its job. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we think the brain does it. Now, when we get excited, if you're praised, if you're rewarded, if you find some food that you did not expect that was very good or very bad, if you stumble, if you have an automobile accident, if you're praised, if you're insulted, you're going to remember that a little bit late, a little bit better. There's nothing you can do about it. It is automatic. Now, when those things happen, you're also going to release to yourself stress hormones, and it happens instantly. So if you're insulted, your face is going to turn red, your body is going to feel warm, and that's because of the, the action of adrenaline, or we call it epinephrine. Epinephrine is adrenaline. And that turns on immediately, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's absolutely automatic. If you're embarrassed and your face turns red, thank you, adrenaline. That's what it did. Now there's a, a booster shot comes along because cortisone is also released, and, and that has to be synthesized, and it reaches a peak about a half an hour later. So you have this first shot of adrenaline, and then you have a booster shot of cortisol that's coming along, and that is not under your control. That is absolutely automatic. When anything exciting happens to you, that goes on, and the claim I'm making is that this is the regulator that helps you, your body, decide which things are going to be remembered at a later time and which ones are not. And I'm going to show you now some experiments that have been done in my laboratory over the years, just a few of them, to give you the flavor of what we do. So here's what I just told you. Uh, you get arousal, the brain gets activated, and on the left you see the activation of the anterior pituitary, the adrenal cortex, and the release of cortisol, or in the rat, which I'll be talking a lot about, corticosterone, very similar. On the right-hand side, we have the activation of the autonomic nervous system, we have the adrenal medulla releases epinephrine or adrenaline. That takes place quickly. On the left, it takes place slowly. But both of these things happen. Now, here's a curious thing. 
if you are insulted, terribly insulted, these things happen afterwards, not before. So how is it that something that comes after an experience can strengthen the memory? And that's what I took on as a challenge in my research. Now, I was helped by <clears throat> findings that started in the 1930s and developed a peak in the late 1940s, showing that electroconvulsive shock impairs memory in humans. If you have ACT treatments, you will have trouble with memory. This was taken into the laboratory by a guy named Duncan at Northwestern University, and he did a very nice experiment in which he gave rats electroconvulsive shock on the left either immediately after they were trained on a little task or at a later time, up to an hour later, and then tested them. And what he found out that memory was impaired if the treatment was given immediately after training, but not if it was given later. And this gave support to a very old notion that had been proposed in, in 1900 by Mueller and Pilsiker in Germany, that memories have to consolidate over time after they are initially formed. The fact that they consolidate slowly over time provides an opportunity then for the hormones that are released by stressful experiences to regulate how strongly that memory will be created. And that's what I'm going to show you. Now at the time, <clears throat> and the, when I first got here, we weren't working on hormones. I was working on the effects of stimulant drugs on memory. And I did a lot of experiments in which I, as a matter of fact, I was the first one ever to do experiments in which we injected stimulant drugs into animals either immediately after they were trained or at a later time and found that in opposition to retrograde amnesia, we could produce retrograde enhancement. I could give a stimulant drug to an animal. If I gave it immediately, there would be enhanced memory. If I gave it later, there would be no enhancement. And that's shown at the top, retrograde enhancement of memory. I'd been working on that for about 10 years. Then, together with a couple of people in my laboratory, we had, I think, an insight, and we said, if we can do this with drugs, maybe there is something in the body that ordinarily does this. See, we were regulating the strength of memory by treating animals' brains after they had learned something. So we said maybe the reason that brains allow that is because there's something in the body that ordinarily does that. And after making a number of mistakes, which all scientists do, after doing some bad experiments, we did some good experiments. And here is one of the first experiments ever done on this by two students in my laboratory. Animals are trained in this task. There's a rat in that white alley. It's never been there before. It's been living in a cage for 60 days. It's put in there and the rat wanders into the gray part, and when it gets to the middle, it gets a mild shock to its feet. That's it. That's the only experience that the rat has ever had outside of that. The next day, we bring it back in the starting alley in the white area, and we say, would you like to go back where you received the shock yesterday? <laughs> if they remember, they will not go back in for a while. If they forget, they'll go right back in. Well, here's an experiment in which we did it. And the first day they walk right in, and then you can see in the white there, the animals stayed out for about a minute the next day before they went back in. Other groups of animals got a dose of adrenaline afterwards, an amount that would uh, increase the adrenaline in the blood as though they had received a strong shock. But they received a very mild shock. And then we gave them a dose of adrenaline, and you can see they really remembered. The only difference between these two groups is they were trained the same way, little tiny shock, but the ones in red got a dose of adrenaline immediately afterwards. If the dose was given later, it was less effective, later less effective, and later and less effective. So here's a time-dependent effect in the experimental application of a hormone that you and I release to ourselves in association with an exciting experience, and we could gain control then over the animal's memory simply with the dose of a hormone that the animal ordinarily releases to itself. Now, we had also been working in the brain on other tasks, and along with scientists throughout the world. Uh, well, first, let me just remind you that the uh, adrenaline, uh, epinephrine, and not to remind, this is new, 
Epinephrine, we discovered from other experiments, activates the release of another substance, norepinephrine, which is like, it's a first cousin to epinephrine, and that is what is released in the brain. So epinephrine is given in the, in the periphery, we release it to ourselves, and then it causes a release of norepinephrine in the brain. Propranolol is a beta blocker, and uh, the, the person who, who built it, who, who created it, won the Nobel Prize for the first beta blocker. We took advantage of that because it blocks epinephrine and norepinephrine, so we had a tool. So what we did was decide to focus on the amygdala because in other experiments we had been working on this brain region, region and had results suggesting that this region was somehow involved in memory. So we decided to manipulate this region of the brain, which I'm showing in a human. We did not use the humans. I'll show you later some work with humans. We used the rat. So here's a side view of a rat brain, and there's a cannula drawn in to show that we could release a little bit of a beta blocker down into this region of the brain after learning. So animals are all prepared. They're going to be trained, and we give a beta blocker and we want to see if the beta blocker put in the brain will block the action of adrenaline or, or epinephrine in the periphery, and that will then identify a target, a, a target in our brains, the brains of animals and in our brains that gets activated. It's not just the peripheral hormone, but it's the place in the brain where it actually does its job. So here's the animal again, sitting, waiting patiently for this wonderful experience. And here is a, um, the results of a group that just got a saline injection, and they did a little bit better than the last group. They stayed off for almost two minutes. Here's the group that got a dose of epinephrine. Immediately after learning, they had a whoppy memory enhancement. Now, in the others, we put a little bit of the beta blocker, propranolol, into this region of the brain called the amygdala. And that's what it did. It blocked the effect of the adrenaline given in the periphery. Now let's just think about the moment. What we have with this experiment, we have identified a very specific region of the brain which is critical in underlying the influence of emotion in making strong memory. Because if we shut this region off selectively with just a little tiny dose of a beta blocker in this little tiny region of the brain, we can prevent the effect of adrenaline in enhancing memory. So this is a, a very important, a single, singly important. Now, an underlying assumption, of course, because we are doing drug manipulation, an underlying assumption is that there is something in the brain that is doing the job, and so the candidate here is norepinephrine. I already told you that epinephrine will cause the release of this other substance, norepinephrine, in the brain. So we said, let's inject norepinephrine directly into the amygdala just directly, so we put a little cannula, as I showed you in the diagram. The animals were trained, and immediately after they were trained, they got a little shot of, norep uh, of, of uh, norepinephrine directly into a subregion of the amygdala. It wasn't even the amygdala, it was a tiny subregion of the amygdala. And we got these results. A dose-dependent enhancement of memory simply by injecting a little tiny bit of this norepinephrine into a little tiny region of the brain. So we've gone from the periphery with a candidate hormone. We've identified a region of the brain, a candidate neurotransmitter. We have identified that the transmitter actually works in that subregion of the brain to do what epinephrine ordinarily would do and put in the periphery. So we've marched through the brain and identified a very specific target. And we have that target. We have that region of the brain, all of us. I'll tell you more about that later. Now, so far I've shown you um, uh, training that is moderately exciting. Animals get a shock to their feet. Now I'm going to show you uh, training in which animals don't get a shock to the feet, but rather these are just ordinary rats that are picked up and put in a box, and there are two objects that look alike. In this case, two light bulbs, and they're put in there for three minutes. That's all. Just put a rat in with two light bulbs for three minutes. Then, on the next day, we put them in with a light bulb and a Petri dish. And you ask, which one do they pay attention to? Believe it or not, they pay attention to the new object. This is called novel object recognition. 
There's no reward, there's no punishment, it's just life as you and I live. You look around, you see things, you do things, and so on. And here the rat saw two light bulbs the next day he put in a box. He said, oh, I've seen a light bulb before, wonder, wonder what this dish is about over here. And the animal, and the animals can remember that. So we decided, can we also now make a strong memory of a mild experience? And we did. So on the left, you see animals that were trained and uh, with, um, uh, under these conditions, and we gave norepinephrine directly into this little tiny region of the brain after they had their three minutes of exposure, and they had huge enhancement of memory as shown in the black bars on the left. With high doses, the effect goes away. It has to be a moderate dose. Now on the right, you see animals that were given 10 minutes of exposure to the light bulb, so they remembered it quite well, and under the, those conditions, if we put the beta blocker, propranolol, into the basolateral amygdala afterwards, we could completely impair their memory. We can completely control animals' memory of fearful objects or benign objects just by manipulating this little tiny region of the brain that you and I have. All of us have this region of the brain. All of us have norepinephrine. All of us have epinephrine. We have everything that the rats have up here. Now, just as a tour de force, we did another experiment which is like this, but it's even more complicated. Look on the left. An animal is given two training experiences in order. On the first, there's two triangles. Look at the top. On the left, there's two triangles and then two circles. The animal is exposed to those two. Then, 24 hours later, the animals are put in, and there's a triangle and a circle in each one. Believe it or not, the animals go to the objects that they did not see the previous day in that box, because it's associated with a specific box. Animals remember what they saw and where they saw it, and we can make a strong memory of that, or we can make a weak memory of that simply by manipulating the noradrenergic activation of this very tiny region of the brain, which is the governor that controls this system. Now, I spoke about cortisol, or in the rat, corticosterone, does the same thing, except it does it in collaboration with epinephrine. The two of them have to work together. The effects of cortisol also involve this region of the brain, the basolateral amygdala, and it requires the activation of norepinephrine at the same time. Now, we didn't know that. You see, all of these things I'm telling you, we did not know. We explored and did the experiment. So now I'll show you the experiment. This is, uh, once again, object recognition. And on the left, you can see in the colored, the enhanced memory uh, on object recognition um, and induced by cortisol or corticosterone that clear it, enhance it. However, if we put a beta blocker in this region of the brain, that effect goes away. So in the same way that adrenaline effect requires beta adrenergic activation in this region, the cortisol effect requires exactly the same thing. They are partners. They are partners in creating the memory, and they converge acting in this region of the brain on using adrenergic systems. Now, all of what I've told you so far uh, is pharmacological. That is, we were in control. We train the animals. We give them the drugs. We make them do what they want because we can supply the drugs to the right place of the brain and so on. Now, the question is, is norepinephrine really released on the amygdala? We've released it experimentally, and the question is, does that happen all by itself? And the answer is, yes, it is. And we did this by um, implanting a probe into this region of the brain. And this probe sends a little solution in and a solution out so we can sample what is in that solution at the end of the probe. And we analyze that to see what is being released in that particular spot. And in this experiment, we measured the release of norepinephrine. We hoped it would be released. We did not know. But we put the probe in to find out. And the answer is yes norepinephrine is released, and it is released by training. So the animals are sitting here minding their own business, and they have a probe, and, 
And now you can see on the left, they're all minding their business. And then where it says five, then they get a training trial. And what you see in all of those lines going all over the place, that's the increase in the release of norepinephrine in this little tiny region of the brain induced by that single light foot shock. So the animals are in there, minding their business, bango, they get a little foot shock. And the norepinephrine now is released in the brain of all of these animals, but not to the same degree in all animals. These are individual differences. So if you look at the top in a, I don't know what that color is, it's orange on my slide, but it, can't, it doesn't look orange there. Look at the top, that animal had about a 700 increase, percent increase in the release of norepinephrine right there. And the next one is about, um, uh, the yellow one, is it? Yeah, the yellow one has uh, about a 500% increase. These are huge increases in release just by that little tiny foot shock that they got. And then on the bottom, there's some dodos. Um, <laughs> the red uh, is nonchalant. This is, this, is, uh, this is Miss Nonchalant, no increase in norepinephrine. And so you could look at that and say, well, it's a mess. Yeah, they increase, but it's all over the place. Look a little more carefully. At the top, right, you see the number of seconds that they remained outside before they went back in. The top animal had a huge release of norepinephrine. It never went back in where it got a shock. We stopped at 10 minutes because I call it the graduate student postdoc boredom threshold because <laughs> they're looking at an animal doing nothing for 10 minutes. That animal did nothing for 10 minutes and it released that much norepinephrine. And you can see others in here. Now go down to the number, the red one at the bottom. That one showed virtually no or hardly any release. The animal walked back in 10 seconds. What you're looking at is a relationship between the amount of norepinephrine released by the training and the animal's expression of that memory 24 hours later. And if I know nothing else about an animal who is trained, and I want to predict the animal's remembering behavior later, this is a good thing to know. How much norepinephrine was released in this region of the brain, and you can predict how well they'll remember at a later time. Now, that's a lot on animals, and you say, uh, but I'm not that kind of an animal. I don't have a white tail. Um, what about humans? Well, there have been quite a few human experiments, some that we pioneered here and some in other laboratories. I'll show you just a couple to give you a, a flavor of it. This is one we published uh, a number of years ago in which, uh, published in 1994, uh, human subjects were, were told a story. And the, the, uh, they were told, I'm sorry, one of two stories, either a neutral story and a rousing story. The neutral story is a boy and a mother leave home, they cross the street, they see a car that's been damaged, uh, they keep going, they go to the hospital, they visit the hospital, uh, the surgeon uh, is, uh, is a disaster preparedness day, and so they see people that have uh, fake bandages on and so on, uh, and the mother who's with them makes a telephone call and goes home. Not very exciting. The other story, you know, and with each statement that I made, there is a, a picture. Every statement has a picture. Boy and, boy and mother leave home. Boy and mother see car. Boy and mother go to the hospital, and so on. There's 12 pictures. The other um, group of people saw the same pictures. Same pictures. Boy and mother leave home. Boy crosses the street. Boy is hit by the car, badly injured, rushed to the hospital. Surgeons work, work frantically to save his life. The mother makes a telephone call and goes home. It's all the same thing. It's just a different story. Now what you see is a difference in two weeks later in the remembrance of the, the, of the neutral story and the arousal story. Not surprising, the arousal story is remembered better. Propranolol, the beta blocker, did not impair the memory of the boring story, nor would we expect it to. But it did impair the memory of the arousing story. So propranolol, the beta blocker, prevented the increase in memory that was induced by having the more dramatic, horrible thing happen to the little boy. The people who had propranolol 
and, and got the story, remembered it as though they had been told a boring story. Here is another work by Larry Cahill, my, my former student, he's a professor here, with his postdoc. And what they did was simply uh, show some emotional pictures to human subject right here at UCI. And then immediately after they showed them, they got a, a, a sample of saliva, and they measured what's called alpha amylase, which is a measure of adrenergic activation. That is, you're gonna analyze the saliva, saliva, and it'll tell you how active the adrenergic system was. Then they tested them um, a week later, and what you're looking at is a relationship between, between the adrenergic activation as indexed by this measure and the memory uh, one week later. And as you can see, it's a very high correlation between the two. It's not perfect, but it's high. Now, I have claimed uh, from on the basis of our animal work that the amygdala gets activated in humans. It gets activated in humans. This is work of one of my former students. This is a, an MRI picture uh, in, in which um, uh, Dominique Dercavan in, in, Brazil, in, in Basel, Switzerland, uh, showed um, emotional pictures to human subjects and measured activation of different regions of the brain. And as you can see, the amygdala, which is that spot that's lighting up with color, that's the region that gets turned on by looking at emotional pictures just as we all expected it would happen, but this was the first direct evidence of, of that uh, in using MRI. Now, uh, before that, however, uh, Larry Cahill with me when he was a postdoc did the following experiment in which human subjects were shown emotionally arousing pictures and the activity of the amygdala while they were watching the pictures was uh, assessed by, uh, by uh, imaging using glucose as the, um, uh, as the measure. And what you see here is the relationship between the measured activation of the amygdala in individual subjects looking at arousing pictures and their memory of those pictures tested three weeks later. And in this case, the correlation is, uh, I forget, uh, yeah, plus nine, very high correlation. The amygdala gets turned on, you remember. And we, we showed that in animals, we showed that in human subjects with the pictures and, and, and with uh, norepinephrine getting turned on, and now we see it uh, looking at uh, imaging in the human brain. Now, uh, science, uh, I've told you about the work that has gone on, a little tiny bit of the work that's gone on in my laboratory over the years, but other laboratories also do collaborative work, they do independent work, and I want to show you very recent work that was done at Emory University by a young man named Corey Enman. What they did, they took um, uh, the opportunity of human subjects who were going, undergoing surgery for epilepsy, and the surgeon implanted electrodes in this region of the brain and the amygdala with the permission and the collaboration of the human subjects and they did memory experiments in these human subjects, training them on material, and then stimulating the amygdala immediately after the training to see if they would get the results that looked like animal results. So here is the a picture of the brain, and the little square shows where the target was to put the electrode in. That's a magnified view of that, and there's a schematic of where that was going into adjacent to, once again, the BLA, the basal lateral amygdala. So the experiment is all set up. The subjects are there. They, they are shown some objects and they're asked to describe them as being indoor or outdoor objects. They're just they're describing, just looking at objects that come by. Then they are tested for their memory of this either immediately afterwards or the next day. But the, they are stimulated after, uh, after the exposure to the objects. So it's the same kind of experiment. They look, they get the brain stimulation, and then they're tested either immediately or the next day. And here are the results. These are brand new this year. Uh, Post-learning stimulation of the amygdala, in, and that's the basolateral amygdala, the same region, um, enhances memory 
of non-emotional stimuli in human subjects. And here's the critical thing. There was no enhancement on the immediate test. So when they stimulated the amygdala after looking at it, there was no enhancement at all. We would not expect it because mem memory consolidates slowly. The enhanced memory was shown on the one-day test. And the amygdala stimulation increased amygdala interactions with other brain regions. So this is the first human study directly stimulating the brain that shows results which correspond actually perfectly with all of the work on animal subjects. Now, Descartes um, said, as you know, that the usefulness of all the passions, all the emotions, consists in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul thoughts which are good for it to conserve. It's good to remember where the shock was. Maybe it's a good idea to remember what stimuli you just saw recently. Maybe it's a good idea remember for rats to remember when they're put in a box what objects were there. You never know where food is going to be found. But in the same paragraph, Descartes said, all the harm they can do consists in their strengthening and conserving these thoughts more than is necessary. That's from Descartes, Passions of the Soul. He anticipated what we now know today as post-traumatic stress disorder, in which emotional arousal, sure, it creates strong memories, but do you want to have those strong memories? And we have ample example today of strong memories of emotionally arousing experiences that are not good things to have because of the overactivation of the system. Now, a psychiatrist at Harvard University a number of years ago called me and he said, uh, I've been reading the work and uh, on the basis of I want to do a study to see if I can prevent the development of post-traumatic stress disorder with propranolol, the beta blocker. And uh, I said, well, I'll talk with you. He said, I'm going to come out and see you. And I said, fine, I'll look at my calendar. He says, no, I'm going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> so he came out here, and he told me about the experiment, and then they did it. And what they did was to have nurses stationed at the major hospitals in Boston. And were, when people were injured in some way, uh, accidents, a, a, a assault, a rape, all kinds of things, the nurses uh, on entry would ask them in the most gentle way they could if they, if they would agree to be uh, part of a, of a study, and many did. And half of the subjects were put on propranolol immediately, and half were put on a placebo, not on propranolol. Two months later, he tested them for signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. The subjects that had the propranolol treatment had significantly fewer signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. That experiment, at the same time, was done by a French group um, and, and published in the same journal uh, the following year, uh, showing exactly the same effect. So this is a, uh, a demonstration in principle. Now you might ask, does this really have therapeutic value? This has been argued by uh, philosophers and uh, uh, all kinds of people ever since these papers were published as it's the right thing to do and so on. That's not my purpose here. My purpose here is to say this fits exactly what we would have predicted and did predict from animal experiments. Uh, immediate treatment or early on treatment will prevent the effects of emotional arousal producing too strong a memory of bad things that, uh, that happen. Now, the problem with this as a therapy, of course, is that, that in order to do this, you have to get hold of the subjects very quickly. Remember, memories consolidate. All of these treatments don't work several hours afterwards. So they were lucky to got, have gotten an effect at all because the subjects will have been taken at least a half hour to get to the uh, hospital before they got the treatment. So I'd say that this is also a study in principle, in principle. And whether it is useful clinically, I don't know, but it does provide additional example that bad experiences can lead to bad memory, that arousal can create that, and we know something about the brain systems that underlie that. Now, William James said, um, of some experiences, no memory survives the instance of their passage. Others may be recalled as long 
as life endures, how can we explain these differences? I think I've told you how. This is my explanation, and it's not based on wondering about it. It's based on an awful lot of experiments, of which I have only shown you a tiny sample of the many experiments published over these uh, 53 years that we've been here. Now, how do we put this all together? If you have an experience, that's getting set up to make a memory. Have an experience, and it starts to turn on regions of the brain over on the right where memories are going to be processed for storage. These are just some of them. There are lots of regions of the brain that are going to be involved in the holding of the information. But at the same time you have that experience, there's activation of the basal lateral amygdala, and there's activation of the adrenal gland. The rat goes in and sees two objects. That happens. Uh, you sit down in your car and start to drive. That happens. That's automatic. That goes on. Now, what happens if that learning experience is exciting? Then you have activation of the adrenal gland, which then turns on the basal lateral amygdala, followed by cortisol turning on the basal lateral amygdala, all going over there to modulate the degree of storage that's taking place in those other regions. These are modulating systems that are automatically turned on, and they are regulators of the degree of storage that takes place in these other brain regions. Now, these are a few of the major folks that, that did some of the experiments I've just shown you. And also, my laboratory manager, Nancy Collette, who has managed to keep this, uh, hurting this group of of uh, malcontents and uh, uh, all kinds of people in the laboratory doing the work 24 hours a day and so on. Where's Nan? Nan? Stand up. <laughs> Nan is as responsible for this, as all of this, as anyone is because she's been on board for all of it and I'm deeply grateful to her. Now, there have been an awful lot of other people who have contributed to this work. These are graduate students and postdocs whose work I just showed you, and I give you some of their names here. Science is an international business. It's not just a local business. And here are some of the countries that people came to UCI to study and have gone back to their own countries, established their own laboratories. And just recently, I lectured in Basel, Switzerland, one of my former students there that now has a big laboratory. I showed, I showed you his work on the human amygdala. All of these people contribute to the work. I'm grateful to, to them for all that they have done to teach me. And I'm grateful to you for coming tonight. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're too kind. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jim. That was fantastic. So thank you all. And um, we have actually a little bit of time for questions. Maybe we'll bring up the house lights and just uh, dim the spots a little bit. And uh, there are going to be microphones that are running up and down. And I'll just call on people with the microphones. And then maybe you can just raise your hand if you've got a question. And Dr. McGaw um, has uh, uh, decided that he's going to spend a few more minutes with us to answer questions about the work. So. Um, if anybody, there's a question, I think, right there. So if somebody can run a mic over. What about people that take beta blockers every day? Does that have any effect on store, storing their memories? They need what? Beta blockers every day. Oh, uh, that's been studied. <clears throat> 
there's, there's no evidence that taking beta blockers every day has any impairing effect on ordinary life. That's been studied extensively. a lot of papers on that. But in those papers that are published, and there are lots of them, they didn't examine whether the beta block are taken every day has an effect on the more exciting things that happen. And my guess is that it does. Uh, but we know that from the experiments that we've done that it does, but in ordinary life, uh, there's no evidence of any significant, of the level of beta blocker that is ordinarily prescribed. Okay, let's take one over on this side here. Yes, I, I am a complete layman on this, but I understand what you are talking about is ep episodic memory. Is the same thing for auto autobiographical memory? Okay. So the question is about episodic memory. Is it the same as, is it the same scenario with autobiographical memory? Uh -huh. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the autobiographical yeah. memory work. <laughs> Well, autobiographical memory uh, is just part of the memory system, and uh, that has not been studied, uh, although you could do autobiographical studies with these patients, for example. After all, they're having an experience. They're having an autobiographical experience, and they could be studied at a later time to find out if their memory of the experience in, in the uh, surgery was improved or impaired by the, uh, by the uh, brain stimulation. But autobiographical memory in humans has not been investigated. Now, in the case of the animals, I think we have done autobiographical memory because we've asked the animals, uh, can you remember having seen this object before in your daily life? You just wandered through and it happened, and the answer is yes, they can if they're stimulated in certain ways. My guess is that autobiographical memory would be. Now, some of you may know, how many of you know my work on autobiographical memory? Any it's simply, it's a, um, over, um, well, uh, 19, um, the year 2000, uh, a young woman came to me and, uh, and didn't come to me. She sent me an email and said, I, I have a memory problem. I'd like to meet you. <laughs> now, what would you think if somebody said they have a memory problem? <laughs> right? Well, that's what I thought. And she said, no, no, that problem is that I don't forget. Well, to make a very long story short, uh, with a little bit of publicity, we soon found more. And, and uh, December 19th, uh, 2010, on a Sunday, see, I can do that, um, <laughs> uh, we appeared on 60 Minutes, and we had six of our, five or six, I can't remember, five, I guess, of our subjects there. And um, they displayed their autobiographical memory, things that they could remember that are totally benign for the rest of us, but they could remember. And um, that appeared on a Sunday night. Uh, I did not actually watch it. I was at a program at, at the Sigurdstrom. I came back, I had, I had taped it, and I had, um, uh, I turned on my, on my uh, computer, I had hundreds of emails, hundreds of people claiming that they either had the ability or they knew someone who had. We have, um, uh, tested all of those people, and we ended up with about roughly 60 people out of the many hundreds who really have the ability. We even found some people who are worse than average who claim they had it. Uh, you never know. And in collaboration with others here, uh, many people here, uh, we did a study of the structure of their brains, and their brains do differ a little from the rest of us. More recently, in collaboration with a former student in uh, Rome, Italy, um, uh, a group of these subjects were examined, and it turns out that there are ways in which their brain is activated by learning, which is exaggerated in those people uh, in comparison with us, and we just published that a couple of months ago. So we're making progress, but we haven't melded these two research projects. That is, I can't say that we've learned something from the autobiographical people, which helps us with the understanding or vice versa. They're, they, they're two projects that I wish would come together and have not, and now Dr. Yasa is gonna be responsible for carrying that on his laboratory <laughs> here, so it's up to you, it's up to you. I really wish you would say you would do this for 10 more years at least so that we can get to the bottom of it together. So we'll take a couple more questions. Are there other questions? I see hands up there. Maybe we can run one mic back there. 
No, no, up here. Michael. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. You know, yeah. as we age, our memory declines. Is it true that if we play chess, play poker, or learn a new language, will it strengthen our memory? So is it, is it true that uh, having these cognitive activities like playing chess and so on would strengthen memories as we get older? <laughs> Should we all go out and play chess now? Yeah. <clears throat> that is highly controversial. Highly controversial. Um, there was a paper published a little over a year ago uh, in which the, the authors uh, analyzed the publications of, I forget how many, a hundred, at least a hundred studies um, that have looked at the effects of playing games and things like that and, and the programs that are sold online to do that. And the answer is that it's either, the effect is either no or the jury is out. It's not, there is no strong, compelling evidence that uh, doing a crossword puzzle will lead you on the way to Einstein. <laughs> it's not that. On the other, other hand, there is recent compelling evidence of something else. Tell them about that, your recent study. Yeah. Physical activity seems to be the thing that... Uh, <laughs> tell them, tell them, tell them. Tell them. So you really put me on the spot yeah, here. Yeah. I wasn't prepared to talk about this. Okay, fair enough. Um, just a few minutes of physical activity. We just discovered recently in a paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago um, that even just 10 minutes of physical activity, mild physical activity, so just walking, um, is sufficient to be able to get a memory boost. And we, in fact, used a test very similar to the one uh, Dr. McGaw talked about before with the, uh, the uh, neurosurgical recordings in epilepsy patients. So there's evidence to suggest that physical activity at least is good for the brain. Hopefully cognitive activity is also good. Um, I'd like to think that coming to lectures like this is always good for the brain. No, this, this one's good. Only yeah. when Dr. McGaw is speaking. This, uh... we'll, we'll take maybe one more up top, right here. Yep. Uh, I was going to piggyback off of the question regarding, like, uh, it, it leans towards nootropics, because I was curious if there's, if we have an idea that norepinephrine uh, can potentially boost the memory, or beta blockers can maybe impair a memory, then I'm thinking how to focus on how we could, like, improve learning through our knowledge of norepinephrine having that effect. And then maybe is, uh, the second part of that question is the dosage. Does the, how much is like, is there too much of a dosage that would have like no effect? Or would there's, is there like an ideal dosage range is the basic question. So to try to parse this a little bit, I think that it's a two-part question. The first one is about potentially using norepinephrine or, or something that interacts with norepinephrine uh, interventionally. And I think your interest is mostly in nootropics, yes. um, things that will act as cognitive enhancers. And then the second piece is about dosage, whether there's an optimality, an optimal dose that would be required for that enhancement. I spent the first 10 years of my research uh, investigating the effects of drugs on learning, and the short answer is, yes, they work if drugs are given only in combination with what you want to learn. It doesn't work just to take a high level of a dose over a long period of time. Remember, that's phasic effect. It's gotta be a boost that goes away. It's gotta consolidate very specific information that is time dependent. And so elevating this over a long period of time doesn't do anything. If we give high doses of cortisone or epinephrine like that, that doesn't do anything. It just changes the threshold. What you need is a boost like that at the right time. And that's why there is a complete failure of huge effort on the part of the pharma pharmaceutical industry over about a three decade period of time to develop memory enhancing drugs. The biology works against it. It just doesn't work that way. So that, that's the answer. Uh, uh, but if you want to take a little bit of norepinephrine and have it handy. <laughs> you know that Tom Lehrer, uh, how many of you know the Tom Lehrer songs from the 50s and 60s, you know? You got, got this song if you're, it's about the Boy Scouts, if you're looking for adventure of a new and different kind and you run into a Girl Scout who is similarly inclined, <laughs> don't be nervous, don't be flustered, be prepared. Well, 
on that note, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Maga again. We actually have a small surprise for Dr. Maga. Um, you know, Jim, you have received every single award that I could possibly think of for research, for training, for excellence in a variety of things. Um, this is one for commitment to public education and service since you were our inaugural speaker here. So I'd like to present you with this award and to say thank you for being our inaugural speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank them all for coming. And thank you all again for joining us. Uh, please feel free to stick around in the lobby. We will have some uh, dessert for you out there, some cookies um, to take on your way home. And we've also got lots of activities and fun things. I think there's a prize wheel out there with lots of giveaways, one of which is actually signed copies of Dr. Magaw's book. So don't miss out on that. With that, drive safe and hope to see you again next time. <laughs>